Esper, and I'm the Secretary of Defense. Welcome to today's Department of Defense virtual town hall. I'm joined today by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, and by the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chairman, uh, uh, Colon Lopez. I want to begin by thanking the 50,000 plus service members who are on the front lines today fighting the fight against the coronavirus. You've made us all very proud and very uh, impressed by your service, your skill, and your selflessness. Uh, the, the accomplishments that you're making in states and cities around the country are remarkable and the American people appreciate it. I know I deeply appreciate it as well. For many of you, you're risking your own health and welfare, welfare as well. And so you have our highest regard and respect. With regard to those forces out there, as many of you know, the Department of Defense has been all in from day one. Over two plus months now, going back to January, we have over 28,000 National Guardsmen activated in every state and the territories. We have thousands of active component and reserve component soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines enlisting, uh, enlisting their support around the country. We have 15,000 Army Corps of Engineers personnel and 1,700 deployed around the company, uh, country helping create and expand hospital capacity in several states. In fact, today, to date, they have, uh, they have conducted over 800 site surveys around the country. We also have deployed a number of Army field hospitals and Navy expeditionary medical units. We have eight urban medical task force deploying. They're going to cities such as New York, where they are most employed. We're in Seattle, Chicago. We will be going to Detroit, New Orleans, Dallas, and elsewhere. So those doctors and nurses, other medical professionals, and other service members are doing yeoman's work out on the front lines. The Mercy and Comfort, as many of you know, are also docked in Los Angeles and New York, providing critical support and prepared to address overflow capacity as needed. On top of that, we've provided uh, a number of medical equipment to our colleagues in HHS and FEMA. We've provided uh, 10 million masks. We provided uh, and transported millions of swabs from abroad, uh, test swabs. Uh, we've also provided ventilators and other pieces of personal protective equipment to our colleagues at FEMA and HHS to distribute around the country. On top of that, our top tier uh, research scientists and medical professionals are helping uh, work with the private sector to come up with a vaccine. They're also working to develop therapeutics to help us get through this uh, crisis as quickly as possible. And on top of that, uh, we continue to, to uh, maintain our top mission, that is making sure the United States remains safe and secure. As many of you know, I've outlined three priorities from day one. First, pr protect our people, take care of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, our civilians, and their families. Number two, ensure that we preserve our essential mission capabilities so we can continue defending the American people, the United States of America, and our interests abroad. And priority number three, provide full support to the whole of government, whole of nation response that we are orchestrating right now. As you know, everyone must do their part to reduce the spread of the virus. We see some light at the end of the tunnel, but we're far from being out of the woods. At this point in time, I encourage you, urge you to follow the President of the United States' 30-day plan and CDC guidance to help reduce uh, the, the spread of the virus. As you know, the CDC recently outlined guidance, additional guidance with regard to face coverings. We immediately also put out our policy on face coverings as well. That uh, face covering says where social distancing is not possible, where you cannot get outside of six feet, then you should wear a face covering if you're off, off a DOD installation. If you're on a DOD installation or base or facility, it is required. Many of our adversaries, as you know, are trying to exploit this crisis, so it's important that we maintain readiness. I have full faith and confidence in our commanders and our senior NCOs to balance mission requirements and, and, and force health protection. It's absolutely critical that we do so. And lastly, I'd like to say that we will ensure four deployed troops receive the support and resources they need to accomplish their very critical national security missions. With that, I'll wrap up by saying I'm very, very proud of all of our service members, whether you're deployed on the front lines of this fight or not, whether you're deployed abroad conducting your national security mission or not, and of course our families. It's been tough times here in the United States, and many of you have, again, put your own health and welfare on the line to help protect your fellow Americans. So you have my highest regard, my respect, and my pride, and I want to thank you for all that. These are difficult times, but I'm confident we will get through this together, and we will be stronger and more resilient on the back end. With that, I'd like to turn over uh, the stage to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, 
General Mark Milley. Chairman. Thanks, Secretary. I appreciate that. And, um, and good morning to everyone that's out there. Uh, I want to uh, just highlight a couple of things that the Secretary just mentioned. W what you heard uh, was a wide variety of capabilities in supplies and hospitals, uh, troops, 50,000 troops, 19 hospitals just out of the Army, seven out of the, out of the Navy, two out of the Air Force, uh, operating in five different cities, taking care of patients all over the place. Uh, and what you see, <clears throat> in addition to the comfort and the mercy, uh, is a significant level of effort uh, by your military uh, and all of you, each one of you, uh, whether you're directly contributing to the COVID fight and one of the 50,000, or whether you're uh, in the remainder of the 2.3 uh, million that are in uniform, uh, every one of you makes us proud. Uh, every one of you is making a contribution, and we will continue to do that. We're going to continue to uh, defend our, our country. Uh, we're going to continue to provide the mission assurance around the world. Uh, we're also going to continue to protect the American people from the ravages of COVID-19 and we will continue to take care of our troops and our families. Uh, so all of you are making a significant contribution to the defense of the United States. Uh, you make all of us proud. Uh, we just ask a couple of things. Uh, one, as you do pay attention to the guidance that's been put out by the CDC and the president. Uh, two, is that you use the chain of command. Uh, we think that uh, information flow up and down the chain of command has been significant over the last several weeks. Uh, we encourage you to continue to use that. And, and third, is take care of each other. Uh, and, and if you see something or someone <clears throat> that is challenged with COVID-19, please speak up, help them out, and get them to the right medical facility. Uh, thank you, and I'll turn it over to the CIA. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. So again, our purpose for doing this town hall is twofold. Number one is to continue to arm you with the facts on what we need to do to get past this pandemic. And number two is to continue to cover our blind spots, the things that we haven't considered yet in order to best help you because it is the feedback from the field that is gonna really help us get to the root cause of a lot of problems and generate solutions. So as we continue to navigate through this minefield, I wanna make sure that uh, you all know that we appreciate your candor, your expedient feedback, but most importantly, your support to one another. We're here to learn from you in order to tailor our guidance, to best uh, care for you and your families, and I will tell you that both the secretary and the chairman have both been really receptive to the feedback from you. So help us continue making it better for everyone. So with that said, let's go ahead and take questions. The first question is from an anonymous Facebook user who are, who's asking, is there going to be a stop loss declaration coming? I'd pose that to the secretary. Uh, I doubt it. I think it's uh, very unlikely. I'll, it would be a measure of last resort and would be very surgically focused. But again, I think it's uh, very unlikely. Uh, it's fair to say, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, we can see some light out there uh, as, we, as we see the coronavirus uh, flatten in areas where we see city, cities say they no longer need our support. Uh, but we're not out of the woods yet. But uh, to me, again, it's a last resort, but very unlikely. Great, and to the secretary and the chairman, we have a question from an army wife based in DC. I understand the COVID-19 situation is uncertain, but soon we'll be approaching the summer PCS season. How will this play out if there are still widespread or localized COVID outbreaks? Will the service members still PCS? Who's coordinating these decisions? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. I'll take first stab at it and then let the chairman respond. It's something that we've discussed a number of times. We will be having another meeting today on this matter. Uh, obviously, we're going to take guidance from the CDC with regard to when things might be able to open up. What we're trying to figure out now are what are the key dates by, by which we uh, have to consider opening up the system again for PCS moves. And some of the priorities that we're focused on are probably first those families with school age kids. We know that you need to get to your next assignment and get the kids in school. I know that's a, a, a particular concern. So as we think through these uh, issues, we're thinking through who are the most affected parties and then what are the, what are the ways by which we prioritize it? Is it by school age kids? Maybe it's by location by which we can release people either from or to the next assignment. Uh, it will involve movers availability, so movers and packers. What is their availability to do that? And if we suspect there may be some uh, lingering effects of coronavirus, what is the medical capability on the other end? So we're trying to consider all those factors. Uh, it involves the services, the joint staff, and of course, Transportation Command, because Transportation Command orchestrates the, the packers and movers. So we're trying to take a very deliberate approach we know there's a date out there by which we must decide and determine if we're going to help people either get their kids in school, get to the next assignment, get to the next professional schooling, whatever the case may be. But we know that is a major milestone and working pretty aggressively on it. Yeah, the, uh, I, I would add that the first is probably too early to tell with any sort of definitive guidance as to what the summer will bring. 
uh, we are clearly, from a policy standpoint, <clears throat> looking to try to open things up in the summer. But the very first priority uh, is the health of the, 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 the soldier, sailor, airman, marine, or the family member of the child, uh, et cetera. So we don't want to do anything uh, that places the health of our force uh, at risk. So if that means further delay, then it means further delay. Uh, we, will, uh, we will work through that, though, as the summer months come. We're very, very sensitive, as the Secretary just said, to school-aged children, and uh, we know that the summer surge is there. There's a lot of factors that go into it, but the very first priority is the health of the troops and the families. Excellent. And I'll pose the next question to the chairman. This comes from Allison Richardson from Fort, Fort Bragg. When is the decision going to be made about the 82nd Airborne's 1BCT extension going to be made? Yeah, the secretary and I are monitoring that uh, along with the CENTCOM commander. You're talking about the 1st Brigade, the 82nd, that's sitting in uh, the Middle East right now. They were deployed uh, back in January uh, as a uh, measure in order to deter any further uh, aggression by Iran and incidents uh, 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 surrounding the embassy or elsewhere in Iraq. Uh, and right now they're still there. Uh, the COVID uh, crisis came upon us uh, midstream. We redeployed uh, one of the battalions, one of the maneuver battalions, but the remainder of the brigade task force, the brigade combat team, uh, has stayed there, uh, in part because of the COVID crisis, but also in part because the situation uh, with the Shia militia groups in Iran, et cetera, is not 100% settled down. Uh, so we're going to do what we need to do uh, in order to protect our force, protect our embassies, protect our troops in Iraq. We have a mission to accomplish. Uh, and the 82nd is America's Guard of Honor, and they will continue their mission until such time as we think the threat uh, has subsided. Uh, but we are monitoring it almost daily, actually, uh, to determine exactly when to bring them home. Uh, the Secretary is very keen on bringing them home, uh, but it's dependent upon the, uh, the overall security situation uh, between Iraq and Iran. Thank you. The next question is for the SEAC, and this is from Tim Galloway of the Air Force. Why are we letting the Air Force cadets graduate, basic military training continue, and waivers for TDYs, but deployed members are unable to rotate home? Yeah, that is a great question. It's something that keeps popping up. We're getting a lot of questions with regards of when our, our, our deployed forces are coming home. But uh, the one point that I would like to make is that we have to maintain a balance between the lethality of our force and readiness and also the safety of our people. We have decided to go ahead and uh, provide the Secretary Best Military Advice Memo uh, in which the service secretaries ended up uh, agreeing to go ahead and take a pause in training to go ahead and reassess the safest way to continue to feed the machine of the services. Also, in addition to that, we have to keep in mind that each case is going to be different. Uh, from location to location in basic entry requirements to deployments to TDYs, everything is going to be conditions based. And again, every, every decision that is going to be made to approve those waivers is got to be safety driven to ensure we keep our people safe. If I could just add something on that, because uh, it's a very good point that the SEAC made, but the, the current uh, curtailment of deployed personnel is critical to the current readiness of the force and the health of those persons. It's vitally important that, that we continue to access folks into the armed services, whether they are officers coming through the Air Force Academy or enlisted personnel coming into any of the services basic military training. The infusion, of, continued infusion of those persons into the force is critical to the future readiness of the United States military. And I know the services are taking all practical measures to exercise social distancing, to, to test uh, young Americans coming into the service, uh, taking considerable effort to make sure we get that right. But we, we must continue to maintain that pipeline coming into the United States military. And another question on PCSing, um, when will consideration be made for service members who've P who PCSed overseas on a dependent restricted tour? My tour is up, yet I've been extended along with many others. And this comes from Chief Warrant Officer Benjamin Ridenhauer, who's based in Kuwait. Again, sa same, same answer really as before. Uh, the uh, first priority is the health and welfare of the, of the troops. So. We don't want to be PCSing or moving anyone anywhere unless we feel very confident that all appropriate mitigation measures are in place for that individual. We're hopeful uh, that, uh, that we're going to open up here shortly. Uh, I don't want to put a date on it and get false expectations uh, raised out there, but I think uh, we're probably looking at opening it up sometime in the summer from a matter of policy. Uh, and yes, there is a uh, sacrifice uh, if you're on an unaccompanied tour. Uh, or in a company tour, for that matter. Uh, if, you're, if you're being extended, there's a degree of sacrifice to that. Uh, but it's all being done with the intent of keeping you and your family safe. 
uh, and that's why we put the stop move and uh, rules into effect and uh, hopefully they'll loosen up here shortly. Great. And I would pose the next question to the Secretary and the SEAC if you'd like to weigh in. What measures will be set in place for transportation offices to ensure our packers and movers are COVID free? Sure, that is, will be part of the discussion we're having today and in subsequent discussions, how we make sure that our packers and movers are, are, are protected and our people are properly protected. So some of the things we will consider, of course, is uh, should there be medical screening before they come upon our bases or come to people's homes or apartments? Uh, also, uh, they would be bound to follow our policy if it still is in effect with regard to face coverings. So all those things that we want to take into account to, again, ensure priority number one is met, protecting our service members and their families. Yeah, and also, you know, uh, with the access to uh, people's belongings and also the accordion effect that is going to be created because of the delay in moves, mm -hmm. we also have to prioritize, you know, so there's going to be certain delays that we want people to be aware that we're going to be dealing with. But in the meantime, safety, again, is going to be paramount. Excellent. Now, if COVID-19 significantly threatens our people and readiness, shouldn't service members and their families be issued appropriate masks to protect themselves? Is this something that DLA or GSA can fill through the supply channels? And this is an anonymous question. Sure, I'll take the first uh, stab at that. Uh, well, we are following CDC guidance, and what CDC uh, guidance basically tells us is that the masks uh, should be uh, and this is a combination of DOD guidance as well. Masks should be reserved for uh, medical personnel, for personnel in contact with either uh, uh, infected persons or possibly infected persons. As many of you know, at this point in time, we've put out uh, guidance that says, with regard to our, our own status, uh, off post, uh, off duty, strongly encouraged uh, that you use a face covering on post, uh, required to use a face covering if you cannot uh, abide by the social distancing rules that have been set forth. So at this point in time, uh, the provision of face masks by DLA uh, is, uh, to, to, is, a, is prioritized based on health care workers, uh, service members who are engaged with uh, health work workers or infected persons, or, or on a critical security mission as they need it. Otherwise, we continue to urge folks to use face coverings, and uh, those can be purchased, those can be made. There are a variety of ways to get them and to uh, ensure you can add a double layer of protection to what you're personally doing. Let me uh, add one comment here on, <clears throat> you said, uh, the question said, um, significant impact on overall readiness. Uh, I, I just wanna remind not only our troops and our families, but also our allies, partners, and our adversaries, uh, that the U.S. military uh, is a very, very large, capable force in all domains, in space and cyber, and the traditional domains of land, sea, and air. Uh, and our readiness is still very high. Uh, and no one should doubt uh, the readiness of the U.S. military to respond and defend the American people if required. Uh, we've got forces and we've taken a appropriate mitigations uh, for, for example, uh, our nuclear uh, strategic uh, forces. Uh, they are uh, being uh, mitigated against uh, COVID. Uh, other types of forces. Uh, reaction forces, uh, high-end soft forces, et cetera. Uh, so we're taking all appropriate measures for that. Uh, and I don't want anyone out there in the world to think that somehow uh, the U.S. military's readiness is significantly degraded. It is not. Uh, of course, the headline news is the Teddy Roosevelt, uh, and that, that has been significant uh, as an individual ship. But the Teddy Roosevelt in and of itself has got about 400 positive tested, uh, uh, COVID positive uh, test results so far out of a crew of 5,000, and although that is significant for that particular ship, uh, we think, our assessment, both uh, the PACOM commander and joint staff, myself, et cetera, uh, is that if required in time of uh, uh, contingency planning, the TR would be ready. Uh, we can put that right back out to sea if, if needed. Uh, and there's a lot of other capabilities out there. We are committing, as the Secretary said, 50,000 troops and medical assets and so on. All of that's important, but if you look at supplies, we. we uh, the Secretary committed 10 million masks, for example. We had a 20% overage in our stockage. That's where those 10 million masks came from. So we are not depleting uh, our readiness to anything that would jeopardize the nation from other types of threats. And, and I just want to clarify that uh, because that narrative is a bit out there and I want to make sure everyone clearly understands uh, the readiness of the U.S. military uh, is still strong, we're still capable, and we're still ready no matter what the threat. Thank you. 
And then the next question I would pose to the SEAC, will the ma uh, and this comes from Lieutenant Colonel Christina Hoggett at Peterson Air Force Base, will the maximum amount of use or lose leave allowed to be carried over because of COVID-19? Yeah, and this is something that we're currently working and the three of us here, we're fully supportive of, uh, of this initiative. We have to go ahead and make sure that our people are taken care of and we realize the hardship. Spring break to begin with, and now, uh, depending how long this goes, people are gonna have some uh, use or lose leave, and uh, we wanna make sure that our uh, service members out there do not lose that entitlement. So, Chairman, anything else to add on that one? No, I think uh, CX summed that up very well, thank you. Great. The next question, prior to COVID-19, some medical treatment facilities lacked staffing to handle routine appointments. Is there any consideration to sending a DOD-wide recall now to increase the medical staff's capacity in order to help provide timely care after we are beyond COVID-19? And I'd pose that to the secretary. Sure. Well, first I'd say we were recently given presidential authority to uh, call up the reserves. I exercised that authority. So we are now reaching deep into our reserves across all the services to find uh, doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals that we can call up and are calling up or have called up already to de deploy to cities hardest hit uh, by the coronavirus pandemic. So obviously New York City is the epicenter and we've already deployed hundreds uh, of doctors there. In fact, we have uh, well over 2,000 right now deployed of uh, various components of the armed services. At the same time, we are also looking to tap into those reserves to uh, backfill uh, into our MS, our medical treatment facilities, those doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals who were deployed as part of that uh, response in support of local and state authorities. So we will continue to do that. The prioritization will be to uh, cities and localities affected, followed by filling gaps in our own MTFs. I can't guarantee that folks will be called up to deal with routine appointments. Obviously, right now, we're, the prioritization is infected personnel, uh, acute uh, patients with some type of uh, acute uh, uh, trauma or disease, or the case may be, but I can't promise that we will call up additional folks just to handle uh, routine appointments. One of the challenges we face as we call up the reserves that is that in many cases they are, uh, during their civilian world, their lives, they are civilian doctors and nurses in, in their own local facilities and hospitals, so we've got to be careful that we don't call people up and take them away from the urgent task of supporting uh, their local community as uh, in their civilian role, uh, particularly if it pertains to the c coronavirus pandemic. So we're measuring all that, taking into careful uh, assessment, and we are calling people up as appropriate. Great. The next question I would pose to the SEAC, what is DOD's intent as far as treatment and after-service care for service members who con contracted COVID-19? And this is from J.W. Reed of the Air Force. No, thank you. Uh, just like every other treatment that we provide our service member, number one, it will be a matter of record. Uh, number two, we will continue to go ahead and treat as we develop the solutions for COVID-19. We'll be able to treat and uh, upon exit of service, uh, expect another screening before you depart, again, to make it uh, a matter of record. But uh, this is no different than any other element that our service members are exposed to. Thank you. And then I would pose this question to the secretary. What is the Department of Defense doing to reassure and support our allies and partners during this pandemic? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's, it's important that we continue to help our allies and partners and friends as we work our way through this pandemic. It's a, it's a global crisis and it requires a global response. And we try and cooperate and coordinate as much as possible. I will tell you that I've been on the phone uh, several times with a number of our my colleagues, uh, ministers of defense in other countries, whether it's been uh, uh, the Ukraine, Italy, uh, Canada, a number of other countries that I've been able to reach out to. And I'll give you some anecdotes, if, if I may, on, in terms of how we've helped a system. So we provided uh, critical medical equipment and uh, humanitarian cargo in the last couple months to allies such as Romania and Italy. Uh, we continue through our uh, combatant commanders to provide uh, health and basic education projects to 22 partner nations through our overseas humanitarian aid and desist, humanitarian disaster and civic aid program. Our DOD laboratories are, are working hard too to provide biosurveillance in a number of countries. Defense Threat, Threat Reduction Agency has provided a lot of support in laboratory and diagnostic supplies to over 28 partner nations across uh, four continents. So we're doing a lot across uh, DOD, across the Department of Defense to help our partners and allies and we will do more particularly as our, our own supply chains get up and running and begin producing uh, medical equipment and PPE, we will be available to share that uh, with, our, uh, with our partners and allies as well. 
Great. And then the final question, the chairman had a chance to allude to this, but I'd pose it to all of you. Um, we have another question on readiness. Do you believe our forces are ready to fight and win in light of COVID-19? I do. Um, I mean, I think uh, our military, as I stated before, and, 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 and I wouldn't want any mixed messages going out there to any adversaries that think they can take advantage of uh, uh, an opportunity, if you will, uh, at a time of crisis. That would be a uh, terrible and tragic mistake if they thought that. Uh, the U.S. military is very, very capable um, to conduct uh, whatever operations are necessary to defend the American people. Um, and we are uh, ready today, we'll be ready tomorrow, and we will uh, adapt ourselves to be able to operate within a COVID-19 environment. We're already doing that. Um, and then across the entire uh, uniform military, <clears throat> we've got about, um, call it a little, little less than 2,000, so far COVID positive patients, it'll probably go up. But 2,000 out of 2.3 million um, is not huge. Uh, and, and then you add in the 50,000 medical personnel and National Guardsmen, et cetera, that are committed to the states and so on. So uh, we are dealing with COVID-19, but we are doing so uh, to minimize the impact on operational readiness uh, to be able to respond to any contingency. So I'm very confident in the, mil in, in the US military's ability to respond if necessary. Hopefully it won't be necessary, but we can and will if necessary. Yes, I'm absolutely confident that we are very ready to uh, handle any mission that comes our way. And uh, why is that? Because our commanders and NCOs have taken great care to uh, protect our units, to ensure mission readiness. Uh, we've, uh, they've taken a number of measures across the board, whether they are deployed overseas or here at home. So I'm confident they are taking every possible measure to ensure that readiness exists. Again, as you know, my top priorities have been, been number one, taking care of our people. Uh, that's critical if you're gonna accomplish mission two, which is ensuring our national mission readiness. And depending on the type of unit you are and uh, where you're located, uh, how you do that uh, is very different. But as the chairman said too, at this point in time, we have fewer than 2,000 of our uh, service members infected by the virus. And most of them are mild to moderate. Um, we, we have a far, far, far smaller number of hospitalizations, but when you look at that number, it's less than 2,000. It's much lower in terms of a rate of infection than you see in our civilian counterparts. And I, I attribute that to the measures we took very early on, on, going all the way back to, I think, 3 February, when we issued our first guidance to the field with regard to health protection. And we gave our, I gave our commanders, our four-star commanders, our service secretaries, our service chiefs, I gave them the authority to implement that broad guidance as they uh, saw best fit, depending on the types of units they have, the locations, um, the people, uh, the readiness levels and all that. And they've done a, uh, uh, they've done a very good job uh, for the most part in terms of protecting our force and ensuring that mission readiness is there. And at the same time, helping protect our fellow Americans. So I'm, I'm very proud of what our commanders and, and senior NCOs have done. And I'm even uh, just as proud, if not more proud, of our service members, what they're doing on the front lines here in the United States of America. Great, and that's a strong note to end on, but I would just ask if there's any final words um, as we close out this, this town hall. I would just say uh, thank you once again to uh, all of our service members and their family members and our civilians out there who are uh, dealing with this crisis just as we are. I, I really re respect and have high regard for what you're doing and proud for those who are out serving on the front lines, whether it's uh, abroad or here at home. Uh, these are tough times, challenging times, unique times. I haven't seen this in my lifetime. But uh, I know we will get through this. We will get through this stronger than before. Uh, please stay in touch with us through the chain of command. We will continue to do town halls like this uh, every now and then. And uh, we want to hear your feedback. We want to be able to act on it. But keep in mind that we are taking your best interests in mind as we think ahead about everything from PCS moves to schooling uh, to, to medical issues of any type. So we're thinking through those problems. Uh, we look forward to your feedback. And keep in mind those three priorities I've talked about protecting our service members, civilians, and families, that means taking care of yourself and one another, ensuring you're ready to accomplish your, your mission, and number three, full support uh, uh, to our state, local authorities uh, when it comes to the whole nation, whole government response we're in. Uh, tough times ahead uh, as we go through this, but I'm confident that uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel and we will come out of this uh, stronger and more resilient than ever before, so thank you. Chairman? Yeah, I would just, uh, just add very briefly that you know, we're a resilient country, uh, we've gone through very, very hard times uh, over the last 240 years. Uh, we're a resilient military. Uh, many times we have bent, but we never break. Uh, and and that, that, that will happen this time as well. And we will emerge on the other side of this as a stronger nation and a stronger military. And uh, we are extraordinarily proud of everything that 
that every soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman out there uh, is doing to protect our nation and, and to help the people of America through this COVID crisis. See ya. Yes, uh, Mr. Secretary. So for uh, the entire DOD forum out there listening to us today, uh, we ask you to continue to be flexible, adaptable, and versatile in the midst of this pandemic. And what we promise you from our end is that we're going to be your sensors, your synchronizers, and your integrators to find the solutions to this issue. But again, we will fight it. We will go ahead and win against it. And uh, that time will come soon. Thank you all. And once again, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Have a good day.